did I read as a child? Yes, I read a lot as a child. And I came to poetry very early, as I think many children do. Um, it seems to me that poetry often precedes prose for children when you think about nursery rhyme, uh, Mother Goose, Dr. Seuss, which I suppose is most kids' introduction to poetry, uh, and certainly was for me. I was very fond of Dr. Seuss as a kid. But I grew up in Cambridge, England, and uh, I was very fortunate to be in a house filled with books. My parents were both huge readers. Um, they were both academics who taught at the university. And although neither of them uh, was a literature person, my father taught sociology and my mother taught psychology, uh, they loved literature, they loved poetry, they loved books. And so I grew up very much in an environment of readers. Um, and my older brother was also an avid reader as well. Uh, and uh, my parents encouraged me to read as much as I wanted. So I spent a lot of time just uh, sitting on the stairs in the house that I grew up in, uh, reading books. And I would say that I really went to sleep without a stack of three or four books under my pillow between the ages of about eight and 12. And often those books were, were poetry. Um, of course, I read uh, lots of prose as well, um, children's adventure stories, the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, classics of an English childhood. Uh, but I feel very fortunate to have grown up in England because uh, there is a tradition of middle-class uh, children encountering poetry early, uh, memorizing it at school, entering poetry contests. Uh, there are literary magazines for children in England, or else they used to be. Uh, so I was uh, exposed to poetry young. And actually, the poet who was most important to me first was Ted Hughes, who is, of course, better known as uh, a poetry a writer for adults. But he wrote several volumes for kids, one of which is The Earth Owl and Other Moon People. And I have here the 1970 edition that I owned as a child uh, of a volume that I think came out in 1966. And I thought I'd read one of his poems just to give an idea of the kind of thing that I was absorbing around about the age of, uh, let's see, six or seven. Moon Cabbage by Ted Hughes. Cabbages on the moon are not cabbages. They are little old women gabbing old baggages. Where our cabbages are bundles of leaves gently flip-flapping, those are bundles of great loose lips yappity-yap-yapping. Yappity-yap, yappity-yap, yappity-yap-yap-yap. Where our cabbages have hearts, those have gossip gushing out of a gap. Not all of them are just bundles of lips. It appears some are, in fact, bundles of flapping ears, just like bundles of small elephant ears. Flappity flap, flappity flap, flappity flap, flap, flap. Our cabbages are worn out by caterpillars, but those get ragged on sheer yap. So, some are all yap, and some are all ears, and their mutual amusements resound. And they are so tough they can go on at that till their one scaly old shank grows right down into the ground. That's Moon Cabbage by Ted Hughes, one of his poems for children. I think there are uh, poets who've had a major influence on my writing. And one of the things about Wave is that it covers really three sections in my life, my childhood in Cambridge, England, my young adulthood in Jerusalem, where I was an undergraduate student, and then my adult life uh, in New England uh, and the United States, where I moved uh, in my, uh, when I was 23 or so. Uh, so different poets, I think, do inform the three sections of the book because the sections of the book are sequential. The first section deals with uh, childhood in England. The middle section deals with um, life in Israel between 1983 and 1987. And then the third section deals with life in the United States from 1987 on. So certainly as I grew older, other poets came to influence me. Um, I was very lucky in high school to have excellent English teachers, and uh, I fell in love with Shakespeare and the metaphysical poets, uh, as many, I think, young writers do, uh, and they became very important to me. Uh, also, the poetry of Philip Larkin and Seamus Heaney was very much in the air when I was uh, in high school. I also discovered uh, a then young poet called Andrew Motion, who I loved, who many, many, many years later became Poet Laureate of England, uh, although I encountered him again just when I was a uh, high school student. And then 
uh, after I went to college and moved to Israel, I began reading a little more wild, wildly, yes, a little more wildly and a little more widely uh, in world literature. The Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai became very important to me. Um, and uh, I, can si I continued reading a lot of Shakespeare and, and ultimately, in fact, became a, a teacher of Shakespeare. And uh, I'm trying to think about other poets who were important to me along the way and who informed the book. I would say that probably the main voices that are behind the poems in Wave are probably Auden, Philip Larkin, and Seamus Heaney. I think the English poets really are a bit more in my bloodstream than the modern American poets uh, because of growing up in England and because of memorizing so much English poetry as a child. Shakespeare is also, of course, very important. And there's a long poem in Wave that is a dialogue between Cal Caliban and Miranda from The Tempest. So of course, uh, and it's written in the iambic pentameter line. So of course, Shakespeare is a very important influence as well. The question of the fusion of different cultures in my writing um, is an interesting one. Uh, and I think it's very generous of you to use the word fusion because I'm tempted to call it more a collision or even a train wreck. That is to say, I'm not sure I've really resolved the uh, different cultural influences that have gone into my poetry. And when I look back and, and read over these poems again, which were written over a very long period of time, uh, I see different voices and different cultures jostling for attention, uh, although there are themes that run through. Uh, and certainly, I can hear more English voices informing the earliest uh, section. Uh, I think the ghost of Seamus Heaney, in particular, hangs very heavily over some of the poems early in the book, such as Wandlebury Ring, which is the first poem in the collection. Uh, and I think the ghost of Yehuda Amichai hangs quite heavily over the poems in the middle section of the book, which is largely a sonnet sequence about uh, life in Israel in the mid-1980s. Um, and I'm not sure about the poems in the last section. I think perhaps they do leave the English influence behind a little bit. But having said that, I think that those voices do return in a, in a wave-like way to inform the poems in the final section of the book. So I suppose I would say that I'm, I'm sort of working towards fusion as an ideal, but I think that uh, having grown up in England as a first generation Englishman, um, neither of my parents being English, my father was born and grew up in South Africa, and my mother is a New Yorker, uh, both of them Jewish, I think that one of the themes that comes through in the book is the sense of being of different places and of no place. That is to say, a lot of the book, I think, is about looking for home and looking for a feeling of home. And uh, growing up Jewish in England in the 1960s and 1970s was an interesting experience because in that period of time, the notion of hyphenated identity was not as developed, I think, to generalize broadly as it uh, is and was in the United States. That is to say, to have a Jewish American identity is a recognizable thing, and we have a sense of what that looks like. Whereas in England, uh, to be Jewish and to be English, you know, are you English, are you Jewish, are you Jewish, are you English, it, it, it sat a little bit uneasily growing up, uh, I think. Uh, and also the fact that I grew up uh, the child of immigrants uh, without any relatives at all in England, because my relatives were either in Israel or, excuse me, uh, not correct. My relatives were either in South Africa or in uh, the United States growing up. I think that also gave me a fairly complicated relationship to English identity. And still, when I walk into a classroom with my somewhat odd transatlantic accent, uh, I'm really not sure if I'm English or not. Uh, I suppose at this point, I would just call myself an American. So I'm, I'm working, I suppose, towards fusion in my work. But I think I would rather describe it as a productive tension than uh, something that I fully managed to integrate in my own work. Yes, that's an interesting question, the one about whether, whether poets are outsiders. Um,
I think there are different kinds of poets. I think there are poets who are very, very much rooted securely in a place and a background and a culture, and they can go back and draw from the well over and over and over again. And there are others who are more like uh, anthropologists from Mars. Wherever they are, they feel a little bit to the side of things. And um, I'm not sure what category I would put myself in. Um, I think that many of the poems in my collection are about being in a place and trying to be of that place at the same time. And part of the work of the poetry is to root down in place and root down in history and root down into the origins of words to try and uh, root the speaker of the poetry in a particular environment. And I am quite fascinated by the roots of words um, and, of course, the way that uh, the English poetic vocabulary is drawn from different cultures and is a kind of history of invasion and colonization in and of itself. The way the book came out is as a kind of gallery of poetic forms. Uh, as you mentioned, um, there are many different received forms in the book, uh, ranging from the huzzle to many sonnets, um, pantoums, villanelle, uh, haiku. Uh, there's uh, one poem, I think, that's written in Tertsarima. There's a poem in heroic couplets and so forth. And I didn't design it that way. Uh, I think that there is a kind of comfort and opportunity in working in received form for me. That is to say, when I begin a poem, I usually don't know what form it's going to fit itself into. But as I start working on it, there comes a point where I feel that the poem can more fully realize itself uh, if it's poured into a particular meter or a particular rhyme scheme. That's not true with every poem, because as you mentioned, some of the poems are in free verse. But usually there's a point in composition where a poem starts to feel like a sonnet, or starts to feel like a pantoum, or starts to feel like a villanelle, or starts to feel like a poem in blank verse. And I will uh, toy with it, play with it for a while. And some of the poems I've tried uh, in different forms, trying to find the right match between form and content. Um, just as I might try a poem in one particular meter for a while and work with it for quite a long time in a particular uh, metrical line and then decide that it's not the right metrical line for that particular poem. And in fact, many of the poems that are written in the tetrameter, the four-beat line, uh, started life as pentameter poems, the five-beat line, um, or have gone back and forth across the divide. One of the things I really enjoy is collaborating with composers. I think it's a marvelous opportunity for a poet, and I'm very grateful that composers have found my work interesting to set. Uh, the collaboration with Kevin Beavers started when we were graduate students at the University of Michigan, and we took a course called Words and Music that was jointly taught by the composer William Bolcom and the poet Richard Tillinghast, and the idea was to get poets and composers together to collaborate on short art song pieces. And Kevin and I did some cabaret songs uh, together and decided that we wanted to continue working with each other. And then in 2000, he received a commission from the Brooklyn Friends of Chamber Music, I think it was their first ever commission, to do a piece for string quartet and mezzo-soprano. And he was looking for words to set. And he rang me up and said, would you like to write some lyrics for this piece? And I said, uh, well, do you have a theme for me? And he said, well, I think it should be about childhood. And um, he gave me some pieces of music to listen to. And I knew that Kevin had recently lost his father to cancer. And uh, I had lost my father uh, to a stroke when I was nine. And as I began working on this piece, it became about the site of an Iron Age hill fort uh, in Cambridgeshire, very near where I grew up, called Wandlebury Ring, uh, which is one of those magical sacred spaces of childhood. I used to go there with my family uh, on Sundays and walk around this ring, which still remains, um, as do many families. And as I worked on this poem and got deeper and deeper and deeper into the history of this particular environment, uh, the poem turned into an elegy for my late father, uh, which 
surprised me, and I didn't know when I started writing the poem that it was going to be an elegy, although I think unconsciously I probably knew that because as I was writing the poem, it came out in elegiac couplets. Uh, that is to say, as I was writing it, I was writing it, uh, it just came to me that way, in uh, rhymed couplets of iambic pentameter, which is the heroic couplet line. Um, and I think Kevin and I very much wanted a piece that could stand on its own musically and also as a poem. So it ended up being a three-part layer cake. That is to say, there's the instrumental piece, which Kevin wrote. There's my poem, which stands alone as a poem. And then there are the, uh, the vocal song lyrics, which come together. And uh, it was first performed in New York City by the Kassar Quartet and a wonderful mezzo-soprano called Stephanie Hatzel uh, at the Brooklyn Friends of Chamber Music. And it's since been uh, revived by the Brooklyn Friends of Chamber Music. And it's also been heard at the Washington Square Music Festival and also in San Francisco. Did I have a happy childhood? Um, I think that there was happiness in it. Uh, certainly, there was a lot of um, pleasure and a lot of joy and a lot of fun. And I tried to get a little bit of that sense into the book with some of the more lighthearted poems. Uh, there's a poem about my Latin teacher when I was 12. Uh, there's a poem about conquerors, which is a game that English schoolboys play with uh, chestnuts that they uh, bake and hammer at each other. Um, so certainly, there were uh, uh, happy and carefree times into it, but uh, in it. But this particular focus of the first third of the book is really about um, my father's death and the aftermath of that. So I think the book is very much uh, shadowed by that event, which really um, is the initial wave that reverberates through the rest of the collection. Yes, it's true. He was a very important um, part of my life. He was a wonderful man, um, very, very vibrant, very full of life, very witty, very funny, uh, loved puns, loved wordplay, um, not a poet. My mother did write poetry um, throughout her whole life, um, although quite different poetry than me. Uh, and she was uh, extremely uh, literate um, and could very easily have been an English professor uh, had she wanted to. But she grew up uh, 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 in an environment where I think she wanted a more uh, positivist uh, career choice and so became a psychologist. Um, So yes, uh, I, think, um, I think the shape of the book is very much about the experience of being a child who's lost a parent young and is trying to make sense of the world and that the form of the poems is in a way a sort of container or a way of making sense for that child of the world. And in general, the forms in the first section of the book are a little more strict than the poems later on in the book, a strict meter, strict rhyme. And as the protagonist of the book grows older, there's a kind of loosening or relaxation, I think, uh, into unrhymed verse and free verse that hopefully signals some more oxygen coming into the life of the protagonist. Uh, there's an epigraph to the book, which uh, is a couple of lines from Yehuda Amichai, uh, and the lines go something like, and for the sake of remembering, I wear my father's face over mine. And the arc of the book is largely about uh, a child who loses his father and uh, grieves for his father, and then is able to heal by becoming a father himself. So the poems in the final section turn to the experience of fatherhood and all of the bittersweet echoes that come up from the experience of parenting a child in a way that one was, in the way that one was not necessarily parented oneself. The poems in the second part of Wave grow out of the experience I had living in Jerusalem between 1983 and 1987. I had originally gone out to Israel just for a couple of months. Um, after graduating from high school uh, on a gap year. Uh, and I fell in love with the city and the country and uh, its 
color and its vibrancy and its uh, energy and its history. And uh, it was really an overwhelming experience for a child who'd grown up uh, in somewhat sheltered, quasi-suburban um, medieval town uh, at that age. So I really discovered Israel at the age of um, 18 and uh, became very, very taken with the idea of being connected to a culture that was at the same time trying to process thousands of years of history and at the same time uh, always in crisis, uh, always very much in the now. When I first moved there in 1983, there was hyperinflation. So as soon as anybody got a paycheck, they would run to the grocery store and load up on groceries because everything would be more expensive in the night uh, than it was in the morning. And I'd never experienced anything like that in England. So the poems in the second part of the book have to do with the experience of being a young man, being in this extraordinarily dramatic and romantic environment, but at the same time holding back in some way or not being necessarily caught up in the fervor of that experience. Um, and also being cognizant of really the tragic potential in the occupation of the West Bank uh, and the territories by Israel in 1967 and a sense that here is a country that really isn't quite sure what to do about the fact of being an occupying power and in the mid-1980s uh, I felt uh, was perhaps a slightly more innocent and hopeful time than now, although perhaps I'm, I'm confusing my own uh, innocence and naivete of the time uh, with the situation. So these are not really political poems in the second part of the book. They're really much more about uh, this encounter with something that is so large and so powerful and so unexpected, that is to say this culture, uh, coinciding with a young man's political, sexual, romantic awakening and what happens when those two things combust. So there are poems that deal with the Lebanon War, which was going on at the time that I was living there, um, and there are very personal poems also about um, uh, people who I knew in that uh, time of life. And again, I think my response to the pressures that were created by this uh, situation, uh, political, personal, uh, emotional, were that the poems ended up largely wanting to be sonnets. And in fact, at one stage, every poem in this section was a sonnet. It was just one long section of sonnets. And then I decided that that wasn't quite what was necessary. So I decided to intersperse a few poems in the middle section that were not sonnets. Um, uh, some of the poems deal with very frightening things that happened to me. There was one time I, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time um, in the uh, neighborhood of uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, with my girlfriend at the time who was wearing slacks and um, we got into a very nasty situation where rocks were thrown at us and that's uh, in the poem. Uh, there's a poem about the experience of living in a house that was originally Arab and having Arab children come and steal lemons from the garden as a kind of protest uh, and about uh, uh, that experience. Um, the last poem in the second section is actually the most recent poem in the entire collection. And it's a dream poem and it's a poem about the claustrophobia that one can sometimes experience in the old city of Jerusalem, which is itself a kind of intensification of all of the tensions that exist in Israel because it's divided into um, quarters, into um, ethnic religious uh, quarters that have a very uh, pressured uh, coexistence uh, together. And the poem came very quickly in an hour or so, uh, 
And it came about as an assignment that I set myself, which is to write a rondeau redouble, which is a, son, a form that I've never before uh, attempted. And it's a form in which, uh, in a very, very strict rhyme and metrical scheme, all of the lines of the first stanza come back at preordained moments uh, ensuing uh, in the poem. And again, I was fortunate, I think, because for that one poem, uh, the form seemed to summon the content, and the content seemed to summon the form simultaneously. So the first draft of that poem was written very, very quickly in about an hour, uh, and eventually ended up becoming the last poem that I wrote for the book and uh, crowning the middle section. It's very difficult to get a book of poetry published and in front of an audience without publishing in individual journals and magazines first. So as a uh, early career poet, uh, one is constantly sending out poems to journals and magazines and contests, um, hoping for a little publication and hoping for uh, something of a track record that editors and publishers will uh, notice, although it's a bit like uh, throwing the empty bottle in the sea. You send your manuscript off and you hope that somebody is going to pay attention. Uh, and uh, I've been lucky in the sense that uh, I really started publishing poems in magazines uh, just about the time I was starting my PhD in the early 1990s. Um, and I've been publishing fairly regularly uh, in journals on and off since then, uh, and I've been very fortunate in that there have been particular editors of particular journals who've liked my work and have supported me over the years. Uh, and that's really, I think, the most you can hope for in a way is to um, find an editor who finds your work congenial to their particular publication. Um, in a sense, I had a little bit of a breakthrough in 1999 when I went to study with the great poet and literary critic John Hollander at the Sewanee Writers' Conference, and he told me about a contest for uh, poets who write informal verse who have not yet published a book of poetry. That's a contest that's run by Southwest Review, which I believe is the oldest continuingly published, uh, the oldest continuing literary magazine in the country. Uh, it's called the Morton Ma Prize. So I entered it, uh, and I won the contest. Uh, and that, I think, gave me the confidence to think, oh, you know, maybe working in form is really something that I should pursue, something that I can do, a, 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 way, in, a, a way of having a, a, a sort of thumbprint and an identity. Um, and uh, some years later, uh, I won another competition, which is run by a magazine called Iams and Trochies, also for a poem uh, in formal verse. So, uh, again, that kind of recognition has been very nice. Uh, and I think that I've also benefited from a return to form in the American poetry uh, environment. There was a period of time when writing informal verse was seen as out of fashion, uh, old fashioned, uh, superseded by free verse. Uh, and now I think there are many, many poets and readers who are interested in returning to the music of meter and the music of rhyme as being something that can help separate poetry from prose. So to some extent, I think that I've been a beneficiary of that. I think there are lots of different kinds of poetry. So the question of whether poetry is written for the eye or written for the ear is a very interesting one. Um, I think that I can only speak to my own poetry uh, on this, because there are many, many different uh, mansions, um, excuse me, there are many, many different rooms in the mansion of poetry, uh, and there's space for everybody. Certainly, my poems are written for the ear as much, if not more, than the, for the eye. And uh, I think it's partly the tradition that I grew up in. Um, that is to say, as a child, I was very attuned to the music of poetry. I memorized a lot of poetry as a child. Most of the poetry I encountered was in meter and in rhyme. Um, and uh, I also wrote a lot of songs as a teenager. I played guitar and I wrote many, many songs, which of course had uh, meter and verse uh, in them. And so for me, the ear is absolutely crucial. And I would hope that people encountering my poetry would give it a chance on the tongue, would, would, would have a sense of these as being poems that can be heard as well as read uh, silently because 
I do try to make the thought as musical as I can um, in the composition of the uh, in the composition of the poems. I'd be delighted. Uh, I'd be delighted to read a Latin lesson, and, and because there's a little bit of uh, cod schoolboy Latin in it, uh, perhaps I should uh, say a few words um, about that. So this is a poem about being uh, forced to learn Latin at my elementary school. Uh, I went to a quite traditional boys' school. It was King's College Choir School in Cambridge, um, famous mainly for its choristers, um, but founded by Henry the Sixth. Um, and I think a lot of the teachers were still uh, the original staff members from that time. Uh, so a couple of uh, words about the Latin that is actually in the poem. Uh, the word KV is a schoolboy cry that means beware. It's from the Latin uh, cave. And the idea is that you post a boy as lookout at the door while everyone's misbehaving. And then as soon as the master is spied, the guard shouts the KV, and then everybody scuttles back to their chairs and looks as if butter wouldn't melt in their mouths. Um, the uh, idea of writing 100 lines is probably familiar to a lot of uh, people, but that is uh, a common punishment for a, uh, for a minor infraction. You know, I must not talk in class. You have to write it 100 times over. Uh, the phrase tempus fugit means time flies. Uh, and then sic biscuitus disintegrat is a little bit tough to translate, but a loose colloquial translation would be something like, that's the way the cookie crumbles. A Latin lesson. They storm in like centurions, my teachers, pausing to gird their loins or tie their shoes, then stomping into class as if to war. Babbage, prefect on watch, shouts a KV! So we assume our most respectful features, pretending we can't smell headmaster's booze, and jump to stand when sir comes through the door. Settle down, boys. Turn to page 33 and Caesar's battles with <clears throat> the Gaul. Obediently, we turn to the dead rows of words like corpses littered on a stage. So far, you first. Translate where we left off. My stomach's in perfect tense. The Roman walls, accusative or ablative? Who knows? Might I ask, boy, if you're on the right page? Sir's nicotine fingers hide a rasping cough. The Roman ditches? I furtively consult my shorter Latin primer, long since inked over as shortbread eating. Could it be the beach? What in hell was Caesar doing? Sir opines, someone else can rescue Gaul, perhaps. Tumult erupts, me, sir, me, sir. Caesar recovers as tongue-tied scholars suddenly find speech. Sofa? Kindly write out 100 lines. Tempus fugit. I shan't waste two A's time. Sir smirks. His victims thrown to the lions, and class drags on till afternoon libations. One nil. Rome triumphs. Barbarian is humbled. A hopeless case. I'm sentenced for the crime of being modern. But empire declines once boys learn more exciting conjugations. Sic biscuitus disintegrat, sir. Rome crumbled. Yes, it is. Noughts and Crosses is one of the two pantoums that are in the collection. Uh, and maybe I should uh, talk a little bit about the pantoum form. So the poem is built up of four-line stanzas that rhyme. Uh, and the first and the third line of each stanza recur as the second and the fourth line of each ensuing stanza. And it keeps going that way until the first and the third line of the poem flip at the end so that it's like a closed box or a closed pattern or a closed frame. So it's quite intricate in the way that uh, all of the lines come back uh, again, stanza after stanza after stanza. So it's a, it's a constrictive form. Um, and it seems to be, for me, quite helpful in poems that have to do with suppressed emotion. Noughts and crosses. And I should say maybe that noughts and crosses is the English word for tic-tac-toe. And when I was a child, when television shows were no longer broadcasting, uh, there would be an image that was just pasted to the screen, and it was a girl playing noughts and crosses with a crown. Clown. <laughs> a girl playing noughts and crosses with a clown. Uh, and this would be an image that would be familiar to any English person who grew up uh, in England in the early 1970s. Noughts and crosses. <laughs>
The day I didn't have to go to school, I watched our silent TV screen instead. The trade test pattern was all I had to fool. I stared until its frozen colors bled. I watched our silent TV screen instead of figuring out where father might have gone. I stared until its frozen colors bled. A girl played noughts and crosses with a clown, figuring out where father might have gone for hours and hours. I sat there gazing as a girl played noughts and crosses with a clown. I didn't see the point, but there I was. For hours and hours, I sat there gazing as the world contracted to a grinning face. I didn't see the point, but there I was, as if by magic I could cross that space, the world contracted to a grinning face. Somehow, I had to get a message through as if by magic. I could cross that space. It felt like something that I had to do. Somehow I had to get a message through until I cut the X into my skin. It felt like something that I had to do, pretending that I couldn't feel a thing. Until I cut the X into my skin, the trade test pattern was all I had to fool, pretending that I couldn't feel a thing the day I didn't have to go to school. No, I, I think that it was just to show people, because they didn't have enough programming when I was a child in England. They didn't have enough programming. It wasn't like the States where programming goes round the clock and through the night. I mean, broadcasting would just end at 12 or 1 or something like that. And then they would broadcast this, or when there was just a gap in programming, they would broadcast this so people wouldn't think their television set had died, you know, so that it would just show that the signal was open, the kind of phatic communication. Uh, but it was just this one image, which I always found to be a little creepy. And for a while, the collection was called Noughts and Crosses. Um, but I found this collection very, very difficult to title. And uh, it went through many, many titles, some of which I came up with and some of which other people came up with, uh, until I settled on Wave. And the first poem of the third section uh, is about a wave that almost drowned me in childhood. Uh, and my father literally saved me from drowning. Uh, as a child, when I was very young, about uh, five or so. And the very last word in the collection is wave as well. So I think in some ways the book was telling me that the wave was a very important uh, image and uh, I just had to pay attention. So there's a lot going on in that middle section. And actually the poems in that middle section, largely speaking, I think, were written first. So they're quite romantic poems. Uh, and uh, they're really a poem, uh, poems about being a young man. I, I think of the middle section as being very much uh, a, young man's, a young man's perspective on the world and a sense of uh, things opening up and falling in love and a feeling that life has somehow begun. And there's a sense of release, I think, in that middle section from the uh, confines of boarding school. And in fact, there were poems that had to do with boarding school in the manuscript originally, but I, uh, I, I took them out. Um, but I was at boarding school between the ages of 13 and 17, and that was quite a, um, an institutionalized period in my life. And certainly being 18 and moving to Israel and falling in love and learning another language and traveling around the Middle East with a backpack uh, was a very freeing experience for me. And I think some of that uh, freedom makes its way uh, into the poems uh, together with the danger of feeling that one is subject to pressures that are not of one's own making, that one's walking into a historical situation of many hundreds of years history and uh, not being sure-footed at all in negotiating that.